Good morning. It's just about time for us to start our class, and so let's open our Bibles up to Acts chapter 8. If you remember last week, we finished up with chapter 7. We looked at Stephen's defense, and, and whenever they killed Stephen for, uh, well, for telling them the truth about their history and showing how they were following in the, in the steps of, uh, of their unfaithful ancestors, and we get into chapter 8, and we see where that leads into where Stephen's, uh, where, when Stephen was stoned, it really kicked off a, a really bad persecution of the church. And so that's where we're going to start today is in chapter 8 and verse 1. But before we begin our class, before we start looking at the text, let's bow and have a word of prayer. Our Father, we, we love you so much and we're so grateful to you that you allow us to look at your word. Father, to look at, um, look at the examples that, that men of faith set for us to follow. And Father, I thank you that we can learn who you would have us to be from your word. And Father, as we study it this morning... I pray that we would be built up, and Father, that we would be motivated to be more like Jesus. Father, I pray that you would be glorified in the discussion that we have, and as we study your text, I pray that it would be just what you want, and I pray that, that we would learn what you would have us to, Father, that we'd be attentive to the text, and that uh, even beyond that, that the things we learn, that we would choose to apply each day as we live. And Father, I pray that, that what we discuss this morning would be just as you want it. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. And so in Acts chapter 8, really the first four verses of that chapter, we see the persecution breaking out against the church after Stephen was stoned. It says, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began, uh, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church. Entering house after house and dragging off men and women, he would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Now that we'll look at that verse again some, but I think that's that's going to be significant as we look at our discussion that what he says there in verse four, and we will we'll take a look at that as uh, along with what it says in the first three verses, and then we'll see what it how it leads into the account that follows. But after the death of Stephen, the Christians began to be persecuted more than just being arrested whenever they happened to be in the temple preaching the gospel. It wasn't, you know, that they were out in a public place and, and, and uh, were arrested at that point. But now, now the church is being actively hunted down. And so the, the persecution against the Christians in this chapter takes a little bit of a turn. It gets more intense. It gets more, uh, it gets more focused. The persecution caused the Christians to be scattered into the surrounding area, it says, into Judea and Samaria. Now, if you go back to chapter 1 and verse 8 of Acts, I want to uh, just give a quick reminder of, uh, of what Jesus said. It, 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 we talked about in chapter 1 of what is the outline of this book and the spread of the gospel. In chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. And we see that as something of an outline for this book. That the gospel begins in Jerusalem. It's preached in Jerusalem. We see that on the day of Pentecost. And we see that for a couple of chapters in what follows in Acts. And here in chapter 8, you have it in Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria. In chapter 8, now in verse 1, this persecution began. It says they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. We see this next move. We see the next part. We're coming into the next section in this outline in Acts that we see in chapter 1 and verse 8. The apostles specifically, though, were not scattered. They stayed in Jerusalem in this persecution, and that's, that's going to be significant in just a moment uh, where it says that at the end of verse 1. Verse 2 tells us that they buried, uh, they buried Stephen. And then we get to chapter 3, and this is where we really get an introduction to Saul of Tarsus. And we, you know, he was already mentioned uh, at the end of chapter 7 that those who were stoning Stephen were laying their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. But now we get a little bit more of a glimpse at just who is this Saul of Tarsus. What is his character like? 
In chapter 8 and verse 3, it says he began ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. He was at the forefront of a very harsh, perse harsh perse persecution against the church in which he was personally out looking for Christians, going door to door, house to house, trying to put an end to the church because now it's become a lot more intense than just whenever they see someone preaching in the temple. Now they're out actively hunting and we see Saul of Tarsus is really the ringleader of all of this. We get a glimpse of his zeal that in trying to make sure that the gospel didn't spread any further. And we see him commenting on this later on. He's entering house, uh, going house to house and dragging men and women off. But later when he's making his defense before the Jews in Acts 22, he mentions his persecution or his, his actions in persecuting the church in Acts 22 verses 3 and following. He says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God just as you all are today. I persecuted this way to death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons, as, the, <clears throat> as also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. From them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were, uh, who were there to Jerusalem even those who were there, to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. So he traveled around in order to try to put an end to the church. He didn't just do it whenever he happens to see a Christian, whenever he happens to hear someone preaching the gospel. He's actively on the hunt, even traveling to foreign cities to, to try to put an end to the church. He mentions his persecution of the church again in Acts chapter 26 as he's on, uh, on trial before Agrippa making his defense before King Agrippa. In Acts 26, verses 9 and 10 and 11. So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme being furiously enraged at them. I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. He wrote to the Galatian church that he tried to destroy the church. Whenever he found out about the gospel being preached before his conversion, he put all of his attention, he focused all of his energy on trying to put an end to this because he believed that the gospel was blasphemy. He believed that it was not correct and he did everything he could to put an end to Christianity. And so we get an introduction here to Saul of Tarsus and we'll see uh, once we get a little further in the book, he will feature very prominently as we're all aware of. But as we consider this persecution that broke out against the church, remember at the end of verse 1 it says all the, they were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And then you get to verse 4 and it says those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Those evangelizing weren't the people in, in the leadership role necessarily in the church. This wasn't the apostles. They stayed in Jerusalem. It was all of the members of the church who carried the gospel with them whenever they left Jerusalem. The attempt to end Christianity just helped it to spread because whenever the persecution broke out in Jerusalem, the Christians began to leave. They weren't timid Whenever they left, they continued to preach it in other places. In Christianity, the, the church continued to grow. They might have had to leave the city, but they weren't intimidated into not speaking about Jesus. They learned from the apostles who weren't intimidated, even after they'd been beaten. And so now, even though they've been forced out, they took the gospel with them. And that's where we get in. In verse 4, it says, Those who had been scattered went out preaching the word. And we have a specific account of the gospel being spread to Samaria. And so we have verse 5 where Philip comes back up. And if you remember, the seven who were chosen in chapter 6, you remember we, we looked at that internal issue of the Hellenistic uh, Jews were upset because their widows were being overlooked in the distri distribution of food. The solution was to select the congregation to select seven men with certain qualifications to, to take care of this. One of those men was Stephen. And we looked at him in chapter 7, 
And we looked at his, his defense of himself. We looked at when he was put to death. The second one was Philip. As you look at their being listed off, and now, so the first one listed was Stephen, and then Luke tells us about him. The second one listed was Philip. And now Luke's getting ready to tell us a little more about Philip. Because he preached as well. It says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which, were, which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. Now there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and was astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from the smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip, uh, when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip as he observed the signs and great miracles taking place. He was constantly amazed. And so we have the gospel being spread to Samaria. As a result of this scattering, Philip is one of those who's left Jerusalem. He left for Samaria and he went out preaching. It says he was performing miracles through the Holy Spirit in Samaria. He was healing, he was casting out demons, and it creates a lot of rejoicing and it was getting a lot of attention. And I mean, if you can imagine, those who are lame, it's going to create rejoicing. Whenever someone who's been lame can walk again. Whenever someone who's been demon-possessed is now free of that. It creates a lot of rejoicing and they're interested in what he has to say. He came and he preached Jesus to them and they believed and we see the, as we mentioned a number of times, the pattern throughout Acts. When the gospel is preached, we see the response to it. They were being baptized. And that's the same response that we see all the way through this book. And so they were being baptized. Simon also believed and was baptized. He realized that there was something different about what Philip was doing because what Simon had been doing was deceiving the people with magic. And when he saw Philip, he could tell the difference between what was real and what wasn't. And you notice there in verse 13 that he was constantly amazed. The one who has been amazing all the people, now he's amazed because he can tell this guy's not just putting on a show, he's not just tricking the people into something. He's actually doing this. And so this gets, uh, this gets Simon's attention. And we see here that even Simon recognizes the power of the Holy Spirit is greater than the power that he had and what he was demonstrating. And it led to his belief but it doesn't take too long. The apostles find out in Jerusalem. The apostles find out what's happened. Verse 14, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of, Je of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. And now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore repent of this wickedness of yours, and pray, that the, uh, pray the Lord that if possible the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. And so now this takes a whole nother, it gets to a whole nother level where Philip has been performing these miracles, but at this point, no one else has been. And when the apostles find out, or when the church in Jerusalem finds out that Samaria has heard the gospel, they send Peter and John. Uh, Jimmy? Yeah, we're, we're just coming to that in just a moment. That's, uh, that's an important distinction there that we're, we're just about to get to. Um, and that is something really important to note here. 
but you have the whenever the church in Jerusalem finds out that Samaria has heard the gospel, they send Peter and John to them for this uh, for this purpose that Jimmy's asking about. That the difference between you know because it says there they had not received the Holy Spirit or they heard that they uh, or not that they had not received the Holy Spirit. They came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for He had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And to, to figure out here, because Jimmy's question is, doesn't the Bible tell us that when we're baptized, we receive the Holy Spirit? And that is absolutely the case. As we've already seen in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, on the day of Pentecost, whenever the people realize they're guilty of crucifying the Messiah, and they ask, what do we do? Peter said, repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, it says that if we don't have the Spirit, we're not His. The distinction and what's important here in verses 15 and 16 and 17 is the wording there in verse 16 where it says, He had not yet fallen upon any of them. Now whenever we're baptized into Christ, the Spirit comes to live within us. And we know that 1 Corinthians chapter 6 tells us that we're a temple of the Holy Spirit, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and we're not our own. But we see that distinction here that throughout this book and other places in Scripture as well, whenever it talks about the Holy Spirit coming on or falling on someone, that's where we see these miraculous things taking place. And so the distinction here is the Spirit being on or the Spirit being in. Now everyone who is baptized into Christ has the Holy Spirit. And we see that uh, there's, you know, we see a number of things in Scripture. There's no such thing as a Christian who doesn't have the Spirit. As we mentioned, Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, if you don't have the Spirit, you're not His. But let's look at Ephesians chapter 1 as well. And this is important to note here, Ephesians chapter 1, the necessity of having the Spirit in being the people of God. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you were sealed in Him with the Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of His glory. The Spirit is given as the pledge or the guarantee or the down payment of the inheritance that we have in heaven. Romans 8 also tells us that it is His Spirit who is in us who testifies along with our spirit that we are the children of God. The distinction here is the Spirit being in, which every Christian has, or on, which we're going to look at a little bit more in just a moment. Uh, JP? Well, and, and you mentioned uh, something very important there, that it was specifically the apostles that were able to lay their hands on and, and give the ability to do the miraculous. But as we consider the, the purpose of the miraculous, you know, it's what Mark says at the end of his gospel, that uh, they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. There was a specific purpose for it. Uh, Ken? Yes, the, he talks about how the miracles, uh, the, the prophecies, the tongues, things like that will cease, as you mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13. But it had a very specific purpose for a time. And it, like you say, it would run its course at a certain point. But it's this text right here where we find out that it is the apostles specifically that can lay their hands. Because if it's, only, if it's not just the apostles that can lay their hands on, on people and pass this on, then why were Peter and John needed? Philip had the gifts. Why couldn't he just put his hands on them? Well, that was not something he was able to do. That had to come through the apostles. That's why Peter and John had to go. And it's only at that point that this was passed on. And so that's where we see uh, a distinction. And this is, uh, you know, as well, what you, what you have here, you know, whenever the Spirit indwells someone, this is not something that you will be able to actually see. Now, you can see the effects of someone who has the Spirit living in them and their character changing. They bear the fruit of the Spirit as they... Or as they grow in Christ and as they, they, they try and they work to be led more by Him. 
But when the Spirit falls on someone, verse 17, they began laying their hands upon them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. What did Simon see? He saw people prophesying. He saw people that were able to heal. He saw people that could speak languages they've never learned. He saw all kinds of things like this. There was something that he could physically see. The Peter and John came and put their hands on somebody, and all of a sudden, that guy can speak another language. And Simon says, I need to get a hold of this, because he was the one who before, you know, he was the one before that had everybody's attention. Oh, this guy is the great power of God, and he's a nobody now. Now that the apostles have come and they can pass this on to whoever they put their hands on. And Simon says, I, I need to get some of this. And so now he has, as it said earlier, he believed and he was baptized. He's, you know, we have where he has become a Christian, but now he's interested in, in being able to have the people's attention again because he'd lost his ability to astonish the people since Christianity come, uh, came. But what we see is his heart was not right with God in this. He's looking for position, power, influence, and it's not rightfully his. Because his goal here was not, or at least from what we can understand contextually, the goal that he had, it doesn't appear, was anything to do with bringing glory to Christ through having that power. But it looks like he might have been tempted to kind of go back to where he was before of, look at me. But it tells us that he was, there was a need for him to, to repent and pray for forgiveness. His heart wasn't right. But there is hope for him to change in what, what he was told. There was hope for forgiveness. He was bound in iniquity, but it needed to change. And then the end of this section, uh, Peter had told him to, to, pray, the, to pray to the Lord for, for forgiveness. And Simon asked him, would you pray for me? And I think I saw a hand up just to... That, that could be a, a temptation if the miracles were still around today to look at the person doing them and not just and not to uh, not to the God who gives the power to do it. Um, we would. And Ken makes a good point that if we had people doing miracles today, that means we've either got somebody old enough to have known the apostles or we've got an apostle that lived a whole lot longer than we think they did. Because as we see in, you know, in this section, the apostles had to come for the gifts to be passed on. And so uh, that's, a, that's a good point. But you know, as you mentioned, Jimmy, there, there could be, if that were still around today, there, there could be some issues with it. Yes, that's a very big step because the Jews didn't want anything to do with the Samaritans. The Jews, when they were traveling that direction, if they, they would generally take a longer route and go around Samaria because they didn't want to go through it. They didn't want to have anything to do with the Samaritans. And so you're right, that was a, that was a big cultural step. Yes, Ken mentions that, that Romans chapter 1 and verse 11 is another passage that refers to the apostles uh, giving the spiritual gifts where Paul is wanting to, to visit Rome to see the people so that he can impart a spiritual gift to them. And it's another one that that helps to, to strengthen the case of what we've talked about here in Acts chapter 8. But Philip didn't stop preaching in Samaria because the next section, when he had solemnly testified, verse 25, and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem. That's, uh, that's the apostles, Peter and John. They were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. Do you think Philip is here in the middle of a very fruitful ministry? You've got converts, you've got people that are interested, everything's going right, and the Lord comes and says, I want you to go out in the middle of the desert for me. Well, you know, on the surface of it, that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. But God's got His purposes here for it. He left behind, Philip left behind a fruitful ministry. He's been in Samaria where there have been conversions, a place where you would think he might would want to stay to help the church grow and mature. But now they've got the spiritual gifts that have been given from the apostles, and God has a different plan for Philip. God didn't send him this time to a city or to a big crowd, but to an individual that apparently had some importance. 
An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him, heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of Scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his, genera his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or someone else? And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And so they came up out of the water, and the, Philip, uh, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and he passed through and kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. And so we have another instance where the gospel is shared. We have another instance where we see that same pattern again, where the gospel is preached and the same response happens yet again. And so Philip preached to this Ethiopian, but this is where God sent him. And this is a, a man who's uh, apparently very religious. He's traveled a very long way to worship. He's interested in doing God's will, and that's obvious just from what you see of what he's been doing and the trip he's taken. Ken? Well, it suggests that he may have had a pretty big influence. Yes, he but he has, and we see this, uh, he has his own copy of Isaiah. That wouldn't have been real common at that time. It indicates that he had some level of wealth along with the, the position that he held, being in charge of the queen's treasury so he's got a an important position this is someone who's very trusted to be in charge with of something like this but what we see is just as in other situations the spirit is the one directing the spread of the gospel the spirit is the one that directed that philip go to where he was the spirit is the one that directed philip to hey that chariot over there go catch up with it the spirit is the one and we see that later on as well in chapter 13 before Paul leaves on the first missionary journey, the Spirit says to the church there, set aside Saul and Barnabas for the work. And so we see God being uh, specifically involved in, in the spread of the gospel. And so Philip preaches to the Ethiopian. He begins by asking a question of this Ethiopian to find out where he is and what he already understands. You know, so this Ethiopian, he's reading from Isaiah. And so the first question is, you know, Philip wants to find out, do you know what this is about? This gives Philip the information that he needs in order to begin to teach him. And that's really important. We've got to find out where someone is before we can help them get to where they need to go. Otherwise, we might be telling them information that's completely useless to them, or we might find that we're, we're at a point that, they don't, that they're not to yet. They may not understand what we're talking about. We may need to go backwards. We may need to go forwards. It may be different. If somebody calls the, the church building here and asks, uh, calls the office phone and they ask, how do I get to the Puyallup Church of Christ? I'd like to worship with you on Sunday. Well, the first thing that needs to be asked is, where are you? Because the instructions are going to be very different if they're in Seattle than if they're down in Graham. And the same principle is true whenever we're talking to somebody spiritual. We've got to find out where they are spiritually. What do they know? What do they understand? Maybe what do they misunderstand? so that we can help them get to where they need to go, spiritually speaking. And so listening to where someone is will make teaching much more effective. And so the Ethiopian doesn't understand uh, where he's at or what he's reading, but he asks, you know, I can't unless somebody guides me, giving Philip the invitation to teach him. And everybody moves at their own speed, like what we see with this Ethiopian eunuch. He was ready to hear it right now, but you're talking about someone that it's taken years that you've had to slowly work on
And, and so we have to be sensitive and careful that we, uh, that we pay attention to where someone is and the level of receptivity that they have or the difficulties that they might have from a number of different areas as far as the, how they would receive it and work with them in a careful and thoughtful way while, and obviously praying about that the whole time. Larry? This is a little bit of a side. Yeah, and when, you know, when you throw things out like that, we don't know where it, where it will go or what the end result will be, but we always try to put kinda, something out there. Dan, I think she kind of act like she knew what we were talking about as Ethiopian was baptized. She was familiar, but it was in it. That's yeah. Yeah. Okay. But we see that, that Philip takes this invitation to, to preach, you know, okay, the, the Ethiopian, he opens the door up and says, you know, well, how can I know unless somebody explains? And that opens the door right up for Philip. And it says he used that scripture and, you know, really convenient place there, the Isaiah passage about the suffering servant, the prophecy of Jesus. He preaches Jesus to him. But it's interesting, you know, he, he begins with this scripture, but it's very obvious he doesn't just stick only with this scripture because... You know, Philip preaches Jesus, verse 36, they're going along the road. And then they came to some water and the eunuch asked, well, what's keeping me from being baptized? Philip preached Jesus to him, but the result is that the eunuch wanted to be baptized. It's not something, when we think about baptism, it's not something that's to be postponed or that we wait for. But also as we consider to fully preach the gospel, we have to preach to people how to respond. And that's exactly what Philip did. What's the, what's the good of, the, of the, the message if we don't tell people how to respond to Jesus? Jesus came to forgive us, but we don't tell them what's necessary in order to actually receive it. And that's what Philip did. He preached the gospel. Here's who Jesus is. And now here's how you are united with Him. Here's how you, are, how you receive the blessings of what He's brought. And it's only when we're baptized that we're buried with Christ, raised to a new life. For that point, we're still dead in sin. It's the exact same as the other conversions that we see in Acts. That baptism is the response that we see over and over. We see that pattern throughout it. But also, we see that baptism here, and we'll see it later on in the book as well, is an immediate response to Jesus. You know, there, there are cases today where somebody says, well, I want to be baptized, but, you know, I think I'm going to wait a week or two so that it can be a big production, or I'm going to wait a week or two so that this can happen or that can happen. Responding to Jesus is a matter of spiritual life or death. And we see here out on a desert road, the eunuch says, here's water right here. What's keeping me from being baptized? He doesn't say, well, you know what, I want to go back to Ethiopia and I want the queen to be there and I want all the royal... No. He wants his sins gone right now. Ken? Yes, Ken mentions that, that there are people who, are, who will not be baptized because of, because of family history, a, a parent or grandparent who they believe is saved but has never re actually responded to the gospel. And what I find a lot of the times is it's, it's an emotional response rather than a logical response to what Jesus has actually said. Um, oh yeah, it's a, it's a response to Him in faith and it, it's a, a completely new life, a new way of life, a new standard of living that we, that we have here as far as the way, that we're, the way that we conduct ourselves. Repentance is obviously tied up in that. But we see here that, that after this, the, Philip, uh, or the eunuch goes on his way rejoicing. And we don't need to miss this point or minimize this. Because becoming a Christian is the most important decision that we can make. It's a joyful occasion. The angels in heaven rejoice whenever someone responds to the gospel message. And what we see of Philip, the Spirit took him away. Philip found himself at Azotus. And there's people here, so he took off preaching where he was. We're going to uh, stop there because we've run out of time. <clears throat> but let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for the message that we've, that we've read this morning and looked at in Acts chapter 8. Father, we thank You for the, the, di the different accounts of conversion that we read about that we can see the pattern that develops in Your Word. And Father, I pray that as we see this, this Ethiopian eunuch in Scripture as one who had joy over salvation, pro Father, I pray that we would have that same kind of joy as we consider that we've been forgiven, that we've been saved, and that we have hope. And Father, I pray that as we see in, in Acts chapter 8 of, of Philip, 
that we in the same way would be willing to go wherever you want us to to proclaim your word and the result would be that you would give increase to your church. And Father, I pray that you would continue to go with us through this morning and that, that you would be glorified in the things that we say and do. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.